Yes, you can start now. Okay. Yep. All right. Hi, I'm Kendra Norell. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Office of Sustainability in the City of Richmond in Virginia. Uh, and my office focuses on, currently we're creating our Climate Action Plan for the City of Richmond, and we're really focused on making sure we uh, get the climate action goals as well as racial and climate equity combined into this planning process. So my job is to make sure that we are engaging the entire community and that they're part of our plan development process and that we are not only meeting our net zero goal by 2050, but also increasing resilience and climate action across the city of Richmond instead of um, in the localized areas, but uplifting the resilience of the entire community for the city so that we become a more sustainable city overall and that we are not uh, we're making sure we're also meeting the needs and priorities of community members while also meeting the needs and priorities of the planet moving forward. So what I do at work, there's definitely a difference between my virtual job and my in-person job. I've not been able to do any in-person activities recently, but before um, we were all put on our virtual tasks. I was scheduled for coffee meetings with community leaders or people or organizations who work with community members um, just to sort of identify what their priorities are, make sure that our planning process is still meeting their priorities, that they're engaged and our actions and goals and objectives are, are things they wanna see in their community. These are things they feel they can actively participate in in their community and that we, moving forward, this is like a, a community plan and not just a plan from the city itself. Um, I would have presentations at different community events, um, especially things like civic association meetings or neighborhood meetings to make sure that uh, all of this information was being shared broadly within the community so that we were able to, to not only inform people of what RVA Green 2050 is or a climate action plan, but also that we were getting feedback from the entire community on what we were doing. And so this really led to uh, being able to establish community projects and community events, things that the community or community members would want to participate in, um, how we could add a climate action or sustainability frame to some of these, these projects that may have already existed. Um, and then one of my favorite things is community charrettes. And so this would be a time where people in the neighborhood would be able to come out and actively participate in the planning process and not just like the verbal part of planning but the visual part and so being able to draw maps and identify where they feel like resilience there there's res environmental resilience in their neighborhood their favorite parts of the neighborhood and just kind of like i share with the office of sustainability the strengths or the things that they want to see changed in their neighborhood in a more visual interactive aspect uh, in my virtual life, I do a lot of video meetings similar to this, uh, where I just have um, interviews or conversations with people in the community. I have, we've recently created an Instagram, so I've been working on identifying what our Instagram posts are going to be and how we want our Instagram presence to be. There's a lot of emails that I send out, uh, and so emailing is a big part of my day, but that's really how we get to the video, how I get to the video meetings and the interviews that I've been participating in to really get the word out beyond uh, the people that we already work with. And um, on tomorrow, we actually have an online survey that's open that closes tomorrow. So um, creating these surveys is really helping to, to really blast out what we're doing and identify how the community feels on certain aspects of our planning process, how they feel about climate change, how they feel about environmental justice and climate resilience. Um, this was really beneficial for us to figure out what we need to work on as an office to, to really engage the community moving forward. So we need to figure out how people feel about climate change, both intellectually and emotionally, so that we could really connect um, on both the intellectual and emotional aspect with, with residents throughout the city to make sure that we are really making sure that we are really speaking their language while talking about climate action and not just speaking on the science part of it. 
Uh, and so one of the things that we're really focused on is making sure that we are very inclusive and equitable in our planning process. So we've created a climate equity index. And so this is um, a map that's made by Geographical Information Systems, so GIS. And we, I, one of my colleagues was able to put this together based off of these factors that you see on the uh, listed on the screen. And so these factors overlaid with each other, we were able to identify where in Richmond uh, residents were at the most risk for climate change. And so the darker the red, the more at risk residents in that area may be to climate change currently and moving forward into the future. And so this is kind of one of the things that we're basing our our planning process on and our engagement process. And so we're really trying to make sure we are engaging these areas that are in the darker red. And when you look at that, those areas, they actually line up a lot with our racial breakdown within the city as well. So we have a lot of black and brown people located in the darker red areas. And so that's one of the reasons that our planning process is specifically focused on racial equity and racial engagement throughout this process because we really want to, to address some of the inequities that, are, that exist within the city moving forward. And so while climate action seems like it would just impact the planet itself, there's a lot of things involved in that process that can actually help with things like affordable housing, education, access and transportation around the city. And so we just wanna make sure that we are providing those benefits um, across the entire city. So as I kind of mentioned before, these, these impacts are not just about how the planet is doing, but how people and our residents are interacting with the space as well. So a lot of those areas have less green space, um, which we know leads to urban heat islands where it's just hotter in certain areas than others and respiratory issues like asthma. So increased asthma risk as well as heat risk uh, in areas with less trees. Uh, if you don't have sustainable and efficient housing, you're paying more bills, uh, especially if you live in one of the hotter areas. And so that just increases the amount of money that you're spending to make sure that you're living in a comfortable um, in, inside environment that other people across the city may not be impacted by. Uh, we in Richmond have a significant increase, extreme increase risk of flooding, precipitation, and heat moving forward with climate change. So uh, a lot of the flooding would impact areas around either creeks or rivers. And so we have a river that runs through the city. So we really want to make sure that these flooding events are not impacting residents. Uh, we are, transportation is iffy in some areas. And so we have some lack of transportation to, public, to the public transportation system. There's also not sidewalks throughout certain parts of Richmond. And so just that inability to move around is, is not only negative to the health of the person, but also a negative impact for the air quality and environment because that just increases the need for personal vehicles. Uh, and so we really just wanna make sure that we are meeting um, both the needs of the planet as well as the needs of the community as well moving forward and just trying to make sure we combine both of those things in the process of developing our plan. And so what that means is that we are, we are going to build out this, this climate action plan that really focuses on climate resilience, but all through a frame of equity. Um, so my job is to make sure that equity and that engagement is part of the planning process for us. And so we have people, there's people within my office that focus specifically on climate action, and there's people that focus specifically on climate resilience. And so my job is to make sure that when we put those things together, we are meeting the needs of the community as well. And so that involves a lot of um, meetings on my end. I have a lot of conversations with people in the community, just really making sure that I understand what their needs are and that they are involved in the process to make sure that their needs are also being met moving forward. So how did I get to this point? This seems like a very strange job to have. It's very specific. Um, so from 2007-2011, I went and got my bachelor's in environmental biology and I really thought that the time range for these different parts of my life were very important because from 2011 to 2018, so for seven years, 
I worked in environmental museum education, youth conservation education, and public transportation access. And in that time, I assumed that I would never go back to school again. Um, and that I was just completely done with school and all I needed was a bachelor's. But in that moment, I was really able to sort of identify what I was interested in professionally and what I what kind of work I wanted to do and realized that going back to school was not a negative. It was actually really beneficial to what I was interested in. So I went back and got my master's in urban and regional planning focused on environmental planning, which led to me getting this job where I focus on climate resilience, equity and engagement, which is really where, while I had a planning degree, urban planning has a lot of community engagement and the way that the profession is leaning now is really focused on equity and making sure that the community has ownership within a lot of the projects moving forward. So it's definitely making sure that people who live in an area are part of the planning process and that the planning process is meeting their needs and not just something that urban planners are coming up with on their own. And in this, in this time, I've learned a lot of things. When I worked with youth conservation, I worked for a nonprofit that partnered with the National Park Service. And within that space, I was able to understand why the National Park Service was investing all this time and money in, in different organizations to really help build up conservation skills in urban and youth and youth of color. Um, and it was definitely the first time I really started to look into why, why we would invest in, in different things for environmentalism, by environmentalism and why it wouldn't just be just focused on sustainability, but looking at how, how participation impacts the future. And so one of the things that the National Park Service noticed was that they had a lot of employees who identified as white and not from urban areas. And so they saw the trajectory and trends of the United States moving towards a country with majority people of color, as well as majority people who live in urban areas. And if those people are not invested in the national parks, then there's definitely the risk of, of funding for the national parks and the existence of the national parks are at risk because they would have lost their demographic that they had been engaging with this whole time. And so they saw how, you know, the, the focus on one group was really leading to them not being able to sustain themselves. And I think that that's a very small story for how we should feel about climate action. So we can't save, like we can't improve our sustainability and our climate resilience if we're not focused on, on uplifting the entire community. And so one of the things that I had to learn how to do was connect any topic to climate change and climate action. And that has been so beneficial. Uh, I'm totally gonna skip this one step and go like, how, listening to people was really so important for me being able to identify what they care about. Uh, and then really opening up my education about climate change, climate action and climate like intersectional climate um, work to really identify how I can connect things like oh, I am just looking for shelter to, well, this is why it's so important to have um, sustainable and affordable housing in neighborhoods. And like all of that connects back to both the priorities of the person, but also making sure that we're reducing our impact on the planet. And so people may think that they're not invested in sustainability or climate change or climate action, but the reality is that improving the sustainability of any city or community improves a variety of things for people throughout. So it can improve their connection to health or their transportation access. It can improve jobs. It can improve your bills, how much, like where you live. It's like it just improves so many things that aren't necessarily uh, directly stated and connected to climate change. But because climate change, climate action is all so interdisciplinary, it, it really, impacts a variety of levels of your life. Um, and so also one of the biggest things I learned is how to be flexible and adaptive. I used to be really uh, structured in the way that I move through life. I really like to be on a schedule um, and I like to just know what point A, B, C, how to get there. Uh, but that's not really something that you can do when you're working in um, with community engagement or with climate, because none of those things, 
those things don't have a straight line. And so just making sure that I'm able to just go with uh, the flow of where people are trying to go, how I can move forward was super important um, to just really be able to adjust given information that I had and just move from there instead of uh, being really focused on moving from the spot that I originally expected to move from. So uh, I mentioned before intersectional environmentalism. Um, here's a definition of it, but at the basic point of it, it's just that when you do intersectional environmentalism, you're advocating for the justice of people and the planet uh, and making sure that in the process of trying to reach your climate goals, you're not forgetting the people that are also existing within the space itself. And so that really means that you have to identify different communities moving forward, these things that those communities may value, um, and how to really connect both of those things to environmentalism. So one of the things that I was asked to do was think about what I would change uh, or what I would wish I knew in middle school and high school. And it was really hard for me to think about what I wish I had known in middle school because in middle school, I had a great time and um, I was, you know, just exploring things that were fun to me. I, I, I looked back and I had to think like, you know, I used to really love math um, and I, guess I let society take that away from me and just like make sure that you're not letting other people limit you and you're not limiting yourself. Um, it would have been really awesome if I had started working on conservation work skills like carpentry or trail work or things like that. Um, anything you could think of when it comes to like being outside. So like camping, fishing, uh, that would those would have been really cool things that I wish I had started doing in middle school. Um, but mainly it's just kind of focused on having a like fun and exploring things that were really fun to me and things that I really wanted to do to just see where my interests may or may not lie and just like take it as it comes. Um, but in high school, and I know I had so many feelings in high school as I'm sure everyone does. Uh, and so one of the things that I didn't really let myself do is explore different career options. As I said before, I was very much on a straight and narrow, strict path of what I was going to do with my life. And so I thought that I was going to be a um, computer engineer, which doesn't make any sense when it comes down to it, because I, I don't actually like sitting at the computer. Um, and so really opening up myself to being able to explore things that I may not have originally thought I would want to do would have been really beneficial. I went into college thinking that I wanted to be a psychology major, but I had one environmental history class and it changed everything that I was doing. Um, and so just really opening up myself to, to taking on something new. Uh, one of the things that's super important in my life right now is talking to people. So learning how to network, building professional relationships, getting those professional friendships, I think Build it, learning those skills, social skills, were, are, would be super important in high school. Uh, presentation skills, uh, this is definitely something that's really up to notch in this year. I have given so many presentations and just making, getting that sort of comfort level uh, at a younger age would be great. Um, internships and volunteer work, I had one internship in high school that I had for three summers and I completely disregarded everything that I felt. I worked at a botanical garden and I should have known from that moment, I loved that job that I should have wanted to do things outside, but somehow it just didn't connect in my head. And I really needed to have that one environmental college class uh, to really get things moving for me. Um, and it's really important that high school classes are not the same as college classes. And I mean this in the sense that just because you may not like a topic in high school doesn't mean it's gonna be the same in college. Uh, college focuses on different aspects of different sort of things. I thought I um, really did not like chemistry, but it turns out I didn't have a problem with chemistry in college. It's just like the way that some teachers may teach things or the topics that may be focused. And so it's just really important to not let your feelings about high school classes impact the kind of classes that you choose in college. Um, and you know, one of the biggest things that I think would be really beneficial for figuring out what you want to do is just talk to people who currently work in roles you think you're interested in. See what their day is like. What do they do at work? Is this, does this sound like something you would want to do um, for a good chunk of your day? 
Uh, and then for things like sustainability, there's different aspects of sustainability. So there's social, I work a lot in the social part of sustainability, but there's, um, I have coworkers who focus more on environmental science and resilience in the office. And then I have coworkers who build maps. And so they're really focused on tech, the technical part or the energy efficiency part. So there's just so many paths you can take within the same area and to really identify where where you feel like you're flourishing and where your interests are within that space so it's kind of like uh environmental the environmental space is available to all skill sets and you shouldn't let what you what people make it seem like really limit what you can and can't do within that space so if someone had told me ages ago that i would be my job would be working in climate action and I would mainly be focused on talking to people and making sure that we're meeting community needs. I would just feel like that doesn't make any sense, but it does make sense because that's where environmental science and climate action needs to go. So it's, you know, don't let what you see now limit what you think your possibilities are. Um, and don't feel like you can't explore different classes or topics in school or outside of school. Like you don't have to be in school to learn things. And so just, you know, opening yourself up to what what is out there. Um, and it's okay to not know what you want to do. Like, as I said before, I had those seven years where I was working and, you know, I was just exploring different things to see which area I was really interested in. I thought I wanted to do education, but it turns out I didn't want to be a teacher, uh, but I did want to talk to people. So just really identifying what I do and do not want to do and moving with it and not letting the unknown really discourage me from continuing to grow. Um, and so unfortunately, I am not in the Pittsburgh area, but one of the ways to really get involved with um, like climate action, social media. So Instagram has so many, um, so many pages on, on different ways that people view sustainability and you can look there that could be part of your environmental and intersectionality research there's there's a lot of educational instagram accounts out there talking about how environmentalism is important to different groups of people how that works within different groups of people and just sort of opening up your understanding of what environmentalism is uh, talk with your friends and family like how do how do people you know feel about climate change and climate action do you guys think the same things is there something that you can learn from each other? Is there a conversation you can have? Can you sway someone who may not think about uh, the important, think that climate action is as important as you do? So just like figuring out where everyone is, figuring out what your community is doing. Is there, like we have our climate action plan. Is your community working on a climate action plan? Is there one that already exists? Then you can start working with the plan itself and really um, bringing those projects to light. Uh, businesses that businesses and organizations that you support are do they have climate action and social goals do they align with what you how you want to see your future are you investing in organizations that have the same beliefs as you and so a lot of these things are are things that you can look into if you're going to college are the schools you're applying to do they align with your goals so a lot of if you research a lot of the things that you are spending your time and money with, that's also a really good way to get involved and to learn what, what is going on in the world and what you can and can't do just by um, seeing how you're already investing your time and your money. So yeah, that's all from me about this. I guess if you wanna do a five minute warm up and stretching routine, sitting at a computer all day, is a bit of a bummer, so make sure you move, definitely.